You got it, girl.
Let's stand up to our feet. We're about to begin worship. I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And this is the day the Lord has made. So therefore, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here. I'm glad to have you joining us today. Today is not an ordinary day. It's the next day that God has given us. Let us not take it for granted. We think that every day is a gift from God. And every face you see is a privilege. So with that in mind, turn to the 300 closest friends, shake a hand, say, good morning. I'm glad to see you. Welcome. All right, friends, you may be seated. We're going to begin worship a little differently today than normal. Our children's choir is going to lead us in a call to worship. Now, friends, each of us was a little kid at one time. We were all little children, and life is so quick. It's so short. And one of the implications is that means today really matters. Let's not take it for granted. So I'd like to encourage you to take a breath. The past is the past. The later and the future is held in God's hands. What we have right now is the present. Let's begin with a word of prayer and get our hearts right for worship as our children welcome us. Let's pray. So come thou almighty king, help us thy name to sing. We come to sing thy praise. Father all glorious or all victorious, come and reign o'er us thou ancient of days. That's our prayer this morning, Lord. 
We pray that you send your Holy Spirit on this place, on the songs, the silences, the words, the bread and the wine, all that we have and are. We thank you for the gift of children. God, we pray that our children would be singing children, that we would be a singing church. Send more of the next generation to us, O Lord, so we can reach them with the word that you have of hope and of joy and of life. And begin those things now, even now, right here in us, O Lord, joy and life and hope so that we can have the strength we need today and the hope we need to rise and face tomorrow. We pray this expectantly in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all the people said, amen. Our children are gonna lead us as we begin this morning. Let's worship together. Worshiping. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel the empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, here we go. He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can save Let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free And the goodness is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me Let me tell you about my Jesus Let my Jesus change your life Hallelujah. 
Let's lift up our voices. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Yeah. Rise is up from an empty grave. Ain't no sin that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Let my Jesus change your life. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we have a new song that we're going to sing, and it's called Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And so it's a modern hymn with beautiful, beautiful lyrics that are very, very rich and good. And actually I was talking to Amber hopping in this week and she said it would be a good funeral song, which is honestly interesting um, because you think through the lyrics and it's all about how our life is wholly bound to Christ and how really that's, that's all we have to rely on. And there's things in our life that'll fail us and that's all we have to rely on. And not only is that enough, but that's like abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so the chorus says, um, to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. So not our emotions, not our circumstances in life, our hope is only Jesus. So to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can see all is mine, but yet not I, but through Christ in me. And so it's empowering that all is ours. We can have everything through Christ and we can have all the good things that he has to offer, but it's humbling at the same time because it's not through us, but it's through Christ in us. And so how can we give back to the Lord? We can join me in singing this song this morning. And so there's a lot of words, um, but it's beautiful. And I want you guys to try your best to sing along, lift your voices. The melody is the same throughout. This is yet not I, but through Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. 
he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hope my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me to this I hope my hope is only Jesus all the glory evermore to be when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me when the race is complete still my lips shall Yet not I, but Christ through me. Father, make that our prayer. Make that the way we live our life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I know I love the hymns and and the songs we sing because they bring such depth and meaning to what we do. You know, the church calendar is beautiful in the way that it celebrates all of the wonderful milestones from Christmas morning to to Easter morning with the lilies that we keep up, and we keep these up until the end of May, where we celebrate Pentecost. Hear these words from one of the songs we sing, King of Kings. I think that's the one. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. That's what Pentecost is about, when the church of Christ was born. And what better way to celebrate the birth of the church than to have a party, right? All right, well, Pentecost morning, we're gonna do just that. Before the party starts, we're gonna have the pregame, which is the service that starts at 10 a.m. One service, and we're gonna pack the sanctuary. We're going to pack the sanctuary, right? All right. So, one service, 10 a.m., and then when we walk out of this place, you're gonna see decorations everywhere. There's gonna be red velvet cake donuts because red is Pentecost color. You're gonna go out into the west parking lot and what you will see is inflatables for kids and adults. We will have food trucks and all kinds of fun for that morning. The thing you need to remember is if you park in the west parking lot, you're gonna need to park a little further out. If you utilize the handicap parking, you're going to need to park over towards the kids' playground. We will have golf carts running all morning to give you easy access to the building. If you are able to park further out, we want to encourage you to do that, to be hospitable. We are expecting to pack the sanctuary, and that means we're going to have a lot of people who are new, and we want them to feel comfortable and have an easy place to park. So we would encourage you to do that. One last thing we're going to encourage for that morning is you to wear your Hawaiian shirts to service and the party afterwards. Now, I know Pastor Graham wore his Hawaiian shirt last week um, to give the announcements. I'm not as cool as he is. But what I did do for you is I I have a picture of me in my Hawaiian shirt so that um, the sport coat hides a lot, doesn't it? So... 
Now, we want everyone to wear their Hawaiian shirts for that morning. It's going to be an incredible morning. Whether this is your first Sunday or you've been coming a long time, we encourage you to register your attendance this morning. That allows us to care for you in a much better way. So if you'll just take out your phone, scan the QR code and do that, that would be great. If this is your first time with us, as we move into this part of our service, we have no expectations of you to give. In fact, we have a gift for you when you leave this place at one of the welcome stations, so please don't forget to drop by there. But if you are a regular attender, you know that when we give, it's out of the abundance of what God has already given us. And we share this verse every week together, First Chronicles. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. As the hosts come forward, let us continue to worship. <laughs>
pray. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name over all the earth. You created the stars and the sun, the tides and the waves, the great trees of the rainforests, the whales that swim along the paths of the sea and even us, oh Lord. And you have made us just a little lower than the angels and crowned us with glory and honor. We are so grateful, oh Lord, for the gift of life today. And we ask that you take a small portion of the gifts that we have given you, Lord, and use them to bring life from this church out into your world. That's what we're asking, O oh Lord, and we're believing for it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all the people said, amen, amen. You may be seated. We're glad you're here with us today. This oldie goldie pick is of the baseball team of the Ohio Wesleyan University battling bishops, the 1904 to 1905 season. And if you look at the picture, you notice that the boys have the hairs and the old timey haircut and they're wearing the old timey baseball uniforms. And there are two men though that stand out. One on the left is not wearing the ball player's uniform because he was the manager, a man, he had a good Methodist name, Wesley Rickey. That's Mr. Wesley Rickey on the left. And then in the middle, you notice there is a man whose skin is different color, a little bit darker than the other players. It was a black ball player on the team whose name was Charles Thomas. In the 1904-05 schedule called for the Ohio Wesleyan University battling bishops to play against the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. And when the team checked into their hotel in South Bend, they were told that they didn't have any room for their black ball-playing brother. Ultimately, the manager prevailed upon the desk agent to allow Mr. Charles Thomas to have a room. But later that evening when Mr. Wesley Rickey, the manager, went up to the room to check on his players, he noticed that Mr. Thomas was upset, frustrated, humiliated, despairing, sort of pulling at his skin, hating himself, hating life, being frustrated. So here's my question for you. What do you do in that moment? What do you do? You could be overcome by emotions and the emotions that you'd be feeling would be legitimate. Could be overcome by anger and frustration, desiring vengeance, hatred. Or you could say, I, I'm not going to get involved. I, I, I don't want to be too exercised about it. So in other words, you could be overcome or you could avoid. It shouldn't surprise you for me to tell you that, as we shall see, Jesus does neither. There's another way, and it's the way he's calling us to follow. Let those who have the ears to hear, let them hear in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Andrew Forrest. I'm the senior pastor here at Asbury Church. We're glad that you're joining us for our third and final week of our emotion series, which is exactly what it sounds like. We're looking at emotions, which are all-powerful and ever-present and summarized by all these crazy emojis here, and we feel them all the time. The challenge, though, is, is to feel our emotions, but not to be controlled by our emotions, but rather to control them. We've been saying throughout the series that you can have gray hair, you can be retired, you can have a whole busload of kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. In other words, you can look like you are chronologically mature, an adult, and still be behaving like a child and still be controlled by your emotions, and still be constantly in the grip of outrage or self-righteousness or fear or anxiety or hatred. But this is not what God has for his people. He's calling us to maturity, to grow up. So we've been looking at that this morning. We're gonna bring it home today. And all this series sits on top of our current Bible reading plan. Asbury is a Bible reading church. We're currently reading through the Psalms. One Psalm a day, every day, for 150 days. So, friends, if you've been doing it, today's psalm is what number? 
Psalm 21, which means, work with me here, tomorrow will be 22. So here's my word to you if you're already 21 psalms behind. <laughs> Cut your losses, man. Just jump on in. Don't try to do it all perfectly. Remember, consistency is more important than intensity. You can pick up one of your psalms books. They're beautiful psalms journals out in the lobby. Pick your bookmark and let's go. You read a psalm a day every day, it'll change your life. Now, you may be here this morning, you're not a Bible reader. Maybe you're not even a believer. I just want to say whatever your week has been like or your life's been like, whatever you look like, whether you believe what we believe, even if you vehemently disagree, in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, you're welcome in this place this morning. With that in mind, therefore, let's take a breath. Attend to these moments which will never, ever come again and open our hearts and minds to what the Lord has for us. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. To that end, O oh Lord, I pray that you take my words now and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Give us insight. And then, God, I pray that you take our hearts and fill them with love and life from you and for your world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Mark chapter 1, verse 32. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. Now, when you read through the Gospels, you will encounter a worldview that's very different from our modern worldview. And for sometimes people have trouble. Maybe you're not a Bible reader. It really troubles you. The idea of like the demonic or demons, something like that. The New Testament sees very clearly that, that there is an evil, malevolent force at work in the world. Tempting, persuading, tricking, deceiving, etc., and one of the things that Jesus does in his ministry is that he frees people from spiritual oppression, from being attacked and controlled by demons. I don't need you, if you're here as an outsider this morning, to accept that so much as I just need you to work through the logic of the story itself. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who are sick or oppressed by demons. I've noticed recently, at some of the big intersections over here, the city of Tulsa has put up some signs to give you instructions about not giving money to panhandlers. Essentially all the time when I come to and from church, there's folks out at the corners. Often they're, they're raving or howling. They're filthy. They have blank eyes. Their clothes are all tattered. They'll come up to cars asking for handouts. They'll be screaming to themselves. They'll walk across the lanes of traffic. These are people that God loves desperately. And Jesus often helps I know just enough about folks like this, particularly from my former church in Dallas, to know that often if you engage with folks like this to really help them, two things will be true. One is, is that it'll be really, really, really tiring work because these folks need a lot of help. And two, will often be really discouraging because for every one person you help, it'll seem like there's another hundred that are almost beyond help. These people are pressing around Jesus. Look at the next verse, verse 33. The whole city was gathered together at the door. Everybody sick, everybody desperate, everybody whose, whose, whose sanity and wholeness is being ripped apart by the chaotic forces of evil, by the demons that are oppressing them. Imagine the smell, imagine the look. And imagine it's all at your door. Peter's, uh, Jesus is here staying at Peter's house in Capernaum, a little village on the Sea of Galilee. Imagine just what it's like to see all that need right there. Now, it might provoke in you anger. Anger at evil. Anger at the state of the world. Anger at rebellion. Anger at deceit. Anger at oppression. You see these folks out here uh, howling at the sky, talking to themselves. Maybe it provokes anger in you. Were they not, were they not given a healthy, faithful home growing up? Was there nobody that can help them now? Why don't we have facilities for them? Why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? Maybe it provokes an anger in you, which is understandable. But we must not give in to anger. 
Among other reasons, look at this verse from James chapter 1, verse 20. Look at the apostle James says, among other reasons. James says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Ooh, boy. You need an idea for your next tattoo? It'll look great right here. Or a bumper sticker. This is profound. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Don't we always think that's the case, though? We get angry at something and we think we're going to make the situation right. Somebody cut you off in traffic, so you lay on the horn. Why? You know it won't really change anything, but somehow you believe you're now participating in the righteous acts of God. It feels good to give in to anger like that. It's tempting to let it overwhelm you like Cain is overwhelmed by his anger at his brother Abel in Genesis chapter 4 to become like, well, not like a human but like an animal, like a beast, to be just controlled by your passions. It's tempting. Or or maybe it's tempting to react against it. So you, you know folks who are getting angry or upset or outraged at things, and then you get angry at the way they are behaving. We've had in my house these last few days one of my brothers visiting with his children, and the youngest is an eighth month old little girl. And you just see her little face just looking. And she smiles, you smile at her. And she sticks her tongue out. You can't help it. In fact, there are studies that talk about how humans are made to mirror other faces and other emotions. And, and you can see these videos online, they'll break your heart, where the adults with an infant were instructed to keep what they call a still face. Give no emotion, give no reaction. And the infants are almost desperate, even after just a few seconds, for a connection with that human face. They become almost unable to control themselves from fear and terror when the adult who's supposed to be loving them and giving them emotional cues just is blank and still. And these are just experiments to show how human emotion works, but of course some people grow up with families like that. And there's something that just breaks in you. If as an infant you weren't loved in that way, it's very difficult in life. Some of you know because you've been working so hard and have been overcoming those challenges you had. Because we were made to receive and mirror the emotions around us. So everybody around you is angry. Maybe they're angry at a good reason. It makes you angry. It can provoke something in you. Or if they're angry at a bad reason or angry for no reason, it might provoke you to come over the top and get angry at their anger. Here's a scene from a documentary. It came out in 1980, if you can believe it. It's called Airplane. Check it out. I can't stand it anymore. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Excuse me. Please let me handle this. I've got to get out of here. Calm down. Now get back to your seat. I'll take care of this. Calm down. Calm down. Get a hold of yourself. Doctor, you're one of the phone. Everything's going to be all right. Okay, it can be very tempting, can it not, when somebody else is freaking out to kind of like either meet them there or try to overwhelm it with a greater anger or a greater noise or a greater emotion. It could be the case that Jesus just wants to kind of just, just, Just give vent to his frustrations at all the people pressing around him. It could be the case that Jesus is overcome by anger or frustration or sorrow at everybody. It's not what he does. Look what he does. Mark chapter 1, verse 34. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Jesus meets them there. He doesn't, well, he doesn't try to quarantine himself from the emotions of the world and just try to protect himself. But neither does he just give in totally to it. He's doing things in the world. I think that's really instructive. So, So you can make the mistake. You can make the mistake of allowing emotions to overcome you. I mean, there's a reason to be angry at things in the world. There's a reason to feel sorrow and grief at things that happen in the world. The world is really difficult. Those emotions tell us something important about what's happening. Okay. But if you end up being controlled by your emotions, you could end up 
the place you don't want to be doing the things you don't want to do. But on the other hand, I wonder if part of the problem with being controlled by emotions is not so much what you do, but what you don't do. It's not so much, well, what you focus on, but what you don't focus on when you're focused on the feelings that course through you. So I'm going to give you an example this morning about focus and the problem with selective attention. I'm going to test. We're here in church. We got a lot of other stuff we could pay attention to. I want to test your attention this morning in this little video. And your job is to count the number of times the players in white pass the basketball one unto the other. Check it out. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Everybody ready? Here we go. So focus here on the players in white. Forget the black t-shirts. They're moving around. It's like a carnival artist. Slide of hand, paying attention. Where is the little ball under the cup? Pay attention, count. Use your fingers, use your toes. Stay focused all the way through because they're going to ask you in a second for your answer. And I want to know we have a church that can pay attention. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15. 15. Good passes. job. But did but you, did see, you the see the gorilla? Watch it again. Right in the middle, some poor guy drew the short straw and has to put on the ridiculous gorilla suit. He beats his chest and makes his way through. See, while you were watching for the one thing, you were all dialed in. It's possible you missed the thing that was right in front of you. Now, what if this is exactly what happens with our emotions? See, see, here's the problem. Can I tell you? We think the problem is people getting angry or outraged at the wrong thing. So, so let's take the media, right, right, right? So we're always arguing about which media channel or figure or thing you should watch. So you say, man, my friends watch MSNBC. It's always lying to them. They need to watch Fox News. Or, or you say, I, I, I'm tired of my friends watching Fox News. I need them to watch NMSNBC. That's where the truth is. Or you could say, you know, I watch CNN. Yeah, that's a joke. Nobody watches CNN. So you have all these, you have all these competing claims about what you should watch. But notice, or listen to, or who you should read. But notice, look, look, look. We're still playing in the same sandbox. We still think the main thing is the information we're receiving. Could it not obviously also be the case that there is a malevolent force that wants you to be arguing and paying attention over those things, meanwhile missing the other things happening around you? See, what if, what if the primary temptation and result of being overcome by your emotions is a temptation away from the mission that God has for you? So can I ask you? Of all the days that you've been given by God, how many of them have you totally wasted by being overcome by emotions? How many have I? Mark 1, they're all gathered about the door and he healed many and cast out many demons. And the very next verse, the very next verse, one of my favorites, Mark 1, you're gonna hear it over and over and over again from me. The very next verse, with all those people crowded at the door, all the work to be done, all the smells of misery and filth, all the people out of their right minds that Jesus is healing. Very next verse. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up and went to a desolate place. And there he prayed.
I was talking about this topic with my wife, about Jesus and how he, he is actually an emotional guy when you read through the Gospels. Now, if you're not a Bible reader, you don't know a whole lot about him or you only know about Jesus from like what's on television, you'll, you have totally the wrong idea, by the way. That's why you need to be a Bible reader. And you may have this idea that Jesus is sort of like uh, Mr. Spock. He's a Vulcan. He has, he has no emotions, just cares about physics and logic or he's some kind of Jedi, just these aren't the droids you're looking for, just keeps going. He's not overwhelmed by these things. This is dead wrong. He's actually a really emotional guy. I mean, okay, when Lazarus dies in John chapter 11, he's really grieved. He cries. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. Then he's angry at death as he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Okay, when he enters the temple the last week of his life and he sees the money changers there working and pressing the poor people, you know what he does? He flips over the table, makes a whip, and drives the money lenders out of the temple. Later that week, on the, the last night of his life, when he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's really, really lonely. And he says to his disciples, Can you all just watch with me? And they fall asleep, and he feels alone. And then, of course, there's a terror he feels on his way to the cross, and many other emotional examples. He's an emotional guy, he feels the emotions. He doesn't um, just sort of withdraw from the world and try to make, make everything clean and nice in him and not engage with the filth or the pain or the violence of the world. He's in the world. He's provoked by the world. But my wife said, you know about Jesus, though. He never allows his emotions to distract from his mission. So he'll argue with folks sometimes for a little bit. He'll heal folks. He'll feel things. But he's always headed toward the goal. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and withdrew to a solitary place and there he prayed. It's like, well, it's like he knows he can't allow himself to be overwhelmed by the emotions of the world and the emotions around him. I believe marriage is until death us do part and our vows are sacred. But I do not believe that if your spouse is in a black pit of emotional of emotional overcoming that the right and loving thing to do is to go down there in there. I believe we have to listen to our friends and weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn like it says in the scripture, but I don't believe the right thing to do for your friend is just to stay there. In other words, the right loving thing is not to allow yourself to be pulled down around to the emotions around you because then you yourself will be in the exact same place, be unable to help and you will be distracted from the larger mission that God has for you. Mark chapter 1, verse 36. Simon and those who were with him searched for him. They found him and they said to him, everyone is looking for you. There's a lot more to be done. Folks are crying. Folks are upset. Folks have a lot of needs. Everybody's looking for you. Verse 38. He said to them, let's go to the next towns that I may preach there also. For this is why I came. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. It's so interesting how Jesus neither becomes some sort of impassive stoic who feels nothing, senses nothing. He's emotional. Because emotions are gifts from God. They're, they're good. They're a gift from God that tell us something important about the world. So he's not impassive and stoic, but neither is he overcome by emotions. In fact, you might say what Jesus does is that he uses emotions to provoke him for mission. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got out and sat in a desolate place and there he prayed. It's like, it's like he needs a little bit of separation, a little distance. In the last seven days, how often 
Have you had the sheer quiet in which you can actually hear the voice of God? And how often did you have these little things speaking at you, claiming your attention, manipulating your emotions? I'm convinced that maybe one of the best ways we as the church can be fit for ministry to offer love to the world is by having times every day when we are disconnected from the world in the way of Jesus. Not overcome by emotions, but learning to overcome them. So here's this oldie goldie pick of the Ohio Wesleyan University baseball team. I love it, the battling bishops. And you see the manager in the left and the black player in the middle, Charles Thomas. These were all living, breathing people like us and now they've all gone to be with their maker. The manager, Mr. Ricky, his first name was a good Methodist name, Wesley. But everybody called him Branch, Branch Ricky. He became a ball player himself in the big leagues, a manager, and then an executive with the Brooklyn Dodgers, where he decided 40 years later he was going to do something about the casual racism infecting all parts of American society and even baseball. And in the position in the front office of the Brooklyn Dodgers, he made an invitation to this man, Mr. Jackie Robinson. And he said, Jackie, I think you can be the first black ball player to break the color line, but here's the bargain. You can't ever react. You can't ever curse. It can't allow, ever allow anger to overwhelm you. When you're spit upon, you can't spit back. When the pitcher hits you, you can't charge the mound. When they scream at you, you can't respond. When they release a black cat in the outfield and say, look, it's Jack Robinson's brother. Or when one of the managers comes along and rubs your head and says, you're lucky like a shoeshine boy, you can't respond. Jackie Robinson, of course, was an unbelievable baseball player. He won Rookie of the Year his first season in 1947. But it was that inner reality that really determined the experiment would become a success. Some people say that the hatred that he endured led to an early grave. He died at age 53 as a relatively young man, Jackie Robinson did. Imagine that you can't react you can't spit back. You can't, well, you can't be overcome by your emotions. You must always keep the larger mission in mind. Don't be distracted. Don't be discouraged. Keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Jesus' mission is to go to the cross and die and reconcile the world back to God. Jesus' mission is to, to die and be raised again to offer the life of God who all believe in his name. That's his mission. And this is ours. Just to receive the life that he came to give. Your life's purpose is to receive the life of God. Your mission is to become more like Jesus. Your life's work is to receive more life today than yesterday and more joy today than yesterday, to be incorporated into the life of God, which is a life overflowing with joy and peace and abundance. That's your life's work. And the temptation from the enemy is to feel your emotions and then give into them and be controlled by them thereby being distracted from the larger thing that God has for you. And it happens all the time. 
Just this past week, we had my brother's family visiting us, some human guests, and some unwanted mammalian guests, small furry things with wings. We have bats at our house. Y'all didn't tell me about bats in Tulsa. This is, I'm not a fan. And they're under the eaves, right where the stone meets the wood. And we've called the pest control and paid the money and signed the contract. I've done literally everything that I can do. They're coming this week to take care of the problem. But over the weekend, I've just been getting rising anxiety. Last night and this morning particularly, what are they doing? Are they causing damage? We can't really see what's happening. What, what if there's a not larger problem? And I'm just feeling anxiety about it. On the very morning, I'm supposed to come and preach here. You see how it works? Don't you get it? Don't you get it? The emotion tells you something and then you, you act in a way and I've done what I can do. But after that, the emotion no longer needs to be invited around my house to sit down at the table with me. I feel my emotions. That's a good thing. The problem is when I invite them over for supper, when I entertain them, when I keep them close, because all the while what's happening is my eyes are no longer on, on God and no longer on mission. And I'm being distracted. And same for you. And here's what's beautiful. We were created to mirror the emotions and the lives around us from infancy, infancy onward. And very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went to a desolate place and there he prayed. You know what he did there? He just looked at the Father and he received the love the Father pours out on the Son. The Son loved the Father back. When, when you just focus on the Lord, you become to mirror that which you are focused upon. And your heart becomes filled with joy because God's heart is joyful. And you have hope because God gives hope and you have life in his name. Friends, it's not so much that God has things we must accomplish so much as God has a plan for who we are to be. And the more that we are like Jesus and the more we listen to the still small voice and the quiet, the more we actually are able to accomplish what he wants for us and do the things that matter in the world. So by all means, experience your emotions, but let them provoke you toward mission, toward Christ, toward becoming like him and let them push you further into the kingdom. And that's my invitation to you today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, amen. Friends, every week in Holy Communion, what we do in church is we just retell ourselves the story so we can be focused on what really matters. So this is the ancient summary of the faith of the church. Let's say these words together. In the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. Stand to your feet. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. That's your mission. That's why God gave you another morning and he's giving you another breath right now because he wants you to become more like him. Let us draw near with faith, therefore, make our humble confession and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Merciful God, we're not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word and we shall be healed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And this is the good news of the gospel. Christ died for us while we were still sinners, and that's proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And therefore, lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image to love and to be loved. When our love failed and we turned away 
your love remains steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, heavenly father, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. By your spirit, Lord, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and then one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God, therefore, let's pray the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning. You'll come forward with your hands like this. We'll give you a wafer and a cup to eat and drink. This is not Asbury's table. You don't have to be a member of our church. It's the Lord's table. It's for all baptized Christians from anywhere in the world. We'd love to have you come as you feel led. Now, if you're here this morning, you're not sure what you believe, you're, you maybe you, you haven't yet crossed the line of faith, maybe you just want to sit, stay seated and say, Lord, Lord, if you're real, speak to me. Maybe you want to come forward if you make the sign of this. We won't give you the elements if you don't want them, but we'll pronounce a sign of blessing over you. If you're interested in baptism, by the way, we have a baptism Sunday coming up in a class. And uh, May the 14th, we have a baptism Sunday. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But friends, this is the Lord's table, and it's his will that we would receive what he has for us and thereby become more like him. That's our mission. That's our purpose. The table is open. The ushers will lead you. Please come as you feel led this morning.
Because of that powerful name, all of our problems we send to the cross of Christ. All of our difficulties we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works we send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hopes. Now may the blessings of God Almighty be with you all as you leave this place. Go now in peace. See you next week. Amen.